Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the presentation. I'll be talking about the AMD C++ optimizing compiler, uh, which is a new compiler we have developed over the past uh, few years. Uh, this is the overview of the talk. Uh, the AMD optimizing C++ compiler, uh, in short, uh, known as uh, AOCC. So I'll give an overview of uh, what we have been doing into AOCC and LLVM in particular. Uh, I'll give some, I'll not say 20,000 feet view, but kind of a high level description of the, some of the optimizations that we have uh, worked on in, the, in, in this uh, few years. Uh, I'll not go very deep into the code at this point because there is a lot of ground to cover and I may not be able to uh, do justice to that. Uh, one of the main parts of this talk are the results from the newly released uh, spec uh, CPU 2017 suit. Uh, we will see how AOCC performs, uh, which is, you know, uh, kind of still a new compiler vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the kind of topmost optimizing compiler, which is ICC. And then I'll conclude uh, with a few observations. So on to AOCC overview. So as I said, uh, AOCC is AMD's uh, optimizing C, C++, but do use C, C++, it's not only C, C++. Uh, we actually have worked quite a bit on DragonEgg over the past few uh, years to sub support the Fortran side of things. And off late, uh, we also are working with Flang. And uh, you know, our hope is at some point of time, we'll be able to switch over and provide a kind of AOCC or AOFC, whatever you call it, which is Flang based. The first version of AOCC was uh, released last year, uh, mid of 2017, kind of aligning with our uh, AMD server launch, which is known as EPIC. Uh, AMD, as you may know, did a server launch after a gap of about uh, three or four years. So it was a kind of a big bang launch for AMD and we kind of you know, aligned with uh, that launch. So as you can see, our main targets are AMD Zen and the future processors that are going to come down the line. So we are doing multiple releases every year. And uh, though at one point our plan was to do kind of a mid-year and end of year release, uh, probably that is going to change and we are just going to align with the LLVM releases and still probably do some mid of year releases if required. So optimizations in AOCC, like it looks like a long list, but this is really not the full list. It's just a kind of maybe a 60, 70% snapshot of the important ones that we did. So in this talk, we'll briefly go over uh, mainly one of the top areas of uh, focus for us, uh, vectorization. Uh, we'll talk about strided vectorization, epilogue vectorization, uh, looking at pattern vectorization like SAD and average, uh, SLP, especially uh, jumbled memory optimization, uh, data layout, uh, mainly array remapping, and then array of structures to structure array transformation. Uh, scalar loop optimization is outside vectorization, uh, loop version LICM, path invariance based loop on switching, and improved loop strength reduction. Generic scalar optimizations like uh, recursion inlining and dynamic cost removal, and then some LLC optimizations, including a very, very brief look at the uh, Zenver scheduler model. So the first one, uh, vectorization. This is really a very, very, very important piece for us. And we think that you know, we can get a lot of performance out of the benchmarks, out of uh, applications, out of uh, customer code by applying very, very uh, you know, advanced vectorizing techniques. So uh, as we talk, you know, some of these may be upstream, some of these might not have been upstream, some of them might have been rejected after an RFC. I'll try to give you an update based on you know, what you can see at the, uh, the bottom here. Uh, so, so the first, this is kind of the first optimization <coughs> we did in AOCC uh, starting way back at end of 2014 and beginning of 2015. So this is like really capturing a, a loop sat pattern which is some of absolute difference as you can see. And then some function name are provided in some of the slides. If a function name is provided, you can be rest assured uh, it is coming from one of the spec benchmarks, which was our you know, major, major focus <coughs> going into the uh, EPIC launch. So if you see that the sum of absolute difference coming from a particular function in a benchmark in uh, the spec in suit, 
<coughs> and the goal is to kind of utilize the PSAT BW instruction there and not generate, like if you, if you don't use it, you will get a bunch of instructions from uh, the normal uh, Clang or LLVM. So we actually apply the techniques of uh, understanding the pattern at a very high level, replacing it by a kind of SAD intrinsic and then lowering it down. And there were a lot of discussions, as you can see in the list, and, and I know a lot of people were not uh, happy or comfortable with the fact that very high up we are uh, kind of you know, capturing the pattern. So I think uh, sometime in 2015, late 2015, uh, Google pushed out a patch which kind of got this pattern much lower down in the pipe and not at the loop vectorizer level, which is fine. But what it doesn't do still is if the loop is totally unrolled and you get this SAT pattern repeated eight times, uh, that patch will never catch it. So, so this for our stuff, if, if it's a loop vectorizer, if it is unrolled in the SLP, in both of the cases, uh, it gets generated because we kind of, uh, you know, take the approach of understanding the pattern pretty high up in the loop of the SLU vectorizer, replaced by an intrinsic, and then uh, lower it down. Uh, Epilog vectorization, uh, currently what happens is, once you vectorize a loop, uh, you'll have an epilog loop, uh, which is obviously scalar. And what happens with such loops is if your vectorization factor is high, let's say you have a vectorization factor of eight or 16, you may, in the worst case, execute up to seven or 15 uh, scalar loops, which is really not good because you could have actually vectorized that using a lower vector factor. Like if you have seven, you could have still done a vector factor four and led the last three as uh, scalar. So this was the aim of this particular optimization. There was a proposal, and initially there was a positive discussion, but then uh, I think IAL, IAL kind of came back and said that um, because the way we were generating the code, uh, there were some tests that were coming in into the epilog and probably kind of had some slightly negative impact on the critical path of the, of the loop. But when we really implemented and ran it on our you know, internal stuff, we really see, didn't see that impact, but then you know, based on the fact that there's this V plan coming up and other kind of stuff, uh, we probably expect that you know, the V plan will probably take care of the epilog vectorization in some form probably using a Marx vector generation. Uh, strided vectorization, uh, as you may already know, uh, we have, uh, LLVM already has interleave uh, vectorization for quite some time now, but with strided, we try to do slightly uh, uh, you know, advanced uh, vectorization. So as you may know, if you have holes in your uh, code, uh, holes in your data when you are trying to vectorize like in the one that is shown below, with uh, AI into two, BI into two, CI into three, uh, you need to do something uh, to gather and, and scatter the data. Now, with strided vectorization, what you introduce is something called memory skipping. So what does memory skipping really mean? It means that we introduce a skip factor to not actually read uh, all the elements of the array. So if you see, if you are on a strided load of three into I, uh, what you are going to access is the red ones in, in this line, 0, 3, 6, and 9. So with a normal vectorization, what you may do is you will start with 0, get 0 and 3, you start with 4, get only 6, and then start with 8. So mainly we'll do three loads and then get a packed vector of four elements. So by knowing the exact strided axis that's happening, we actually don't start reading from 4. So once we read from 0, we actually start reading from 6 again. So you can see that by just doing two loads, we can get the, the strided vector of 3i uh, into, into a packed form. Now, if you see that, if you look at the LLVM IR also, uh, the get element pointer moves by six instead of by four. So this is what you call the skip factor, and it works for uh, strided axes where the strides are known at compile time. And uh, so this, uh, this, this will give you uh, improved number of uh, loads uh, when you are having this kind of patterns. Uh, so this was also proposed, but uh, I think the, the focus of our, uh, our uh, implementation was actually restricted to non-scatter-gather uh, kind of intrinsic, 
but there were some issues with that because we were generating shuffles and not uh, um, you know, mass gathers and scatters. On to uh, SLP vectorization. So one of the interesting stuff that you observed was in some uh, benchmarks and axes, even though uh, the memory actually is sequential, they are not really access sequentially. Like in the case here on the top right, if you see, uh, the axes are A1, A3, A0, and A2. So totally, they actually form a sequential memory area of 0 to 3, but they are not really access sequentially. Similarly, B2, B0, B3, and B1, they are not really access sequentially, though as a packet or as a vector factor of 4, they are actually sequential. So we understand this kind of uh, memory accesses. And what we do is we introduce, we call this as jumble loads or jumble stores. We understand these patterns, do a shuffle, bring them into shapes such that they are all sequential, and then we can uh, continue doing our uh, SLP optimizations. Uh, similar for uh, cases like add and sub, uh, and as you know in x86, we can have adds and subs mixed together and have a single add sub uh, vector uh, uh, instruction. And so if you go through normal SLP, uh, that will break down because it is not all adds or all subs, so they are not isomorphic. So we kind of teach the SLP vectorizer there to understand that. So this, this particular patch has been discussed in the community for quite some time, and there were updates, uh, and kind, I think of late, uh, this kind of morphed a bit, and I think someone from ARM, I don't know who, uh, is probably kind of finishing this patch up, so hopefully, uh, we'll get all these things soon inside LLVM. <sighs> VP average V, so this is a small thing, but I just wanted to mention because again, it's kind of a pattern like a SAD, but so if you have a loop of this kind of form, which is usually associated with um, kind of image processing kind of applications, you can in x86 replace it by an average instruction. Um, so that uh, infrastructure was there already in LLVM, but there were costing issues in x86, which was not allowing that to be generated. So that was fixed and you know, that was already upstreamed and we were able to uh, get this kind of VP average instruction out. So that's like, you know, it's not the whole package of things that you do in vectorization, but some of the important stuff where we extended both the loop vectorizer as well as the uh, SLP vectorizer uh, in non-trivial ways uh, to improve on what we have on LLVM. AOCC's uh, data layout transform, I'll talk about the two main data layout transforms that we worked on, um, AOS to SOA, so area of structures to structure arrays. So, you know, this is pretty popular, almost everyone who had dabbled with compilers or programming language would know it. So if you have a structure, uh, uh, array of structures, uh, it can have a lot of cache misses because you may not access all the fields of the structure. And so instead of having that, you morph it into a form where it's a structure, but inside each structure, you now have an array for the individual uh, uh, fields of that. And so later, you also change all the axes and stuff like that. Now, uh, this particular kind of transforms have very strong legality demands. So you have to be very, very careful how you apply this kind of transform because the moment you pass this kind of structures to functions whose internals you can't see or how they behave, you know, you can't apply this transformation. So you have to uh, apply this transform usually, or not only usually, you know, only at uh, FLTO or an LTO kind of uh, level, you cannot apply it uh, below that. There are also certain other problems because if you are applying it under LTO and other transforms, um, when you start looking at the analysis, you may not see all your structures in forms which you want to. So you may have to kind of, you know, stop some of the transforms from happening before you start your uh, struct layout analysis. So this particular transform is pretty tricky. So when you apply it, you have to be careful that uh, your legality and other stuff have been uh, you know, well taken care of. So 
along the lines of AOS to SOA, these are kind of a you know a slightly busy slide, and the code there may not be visible. But this is a slightly different take on uh, array of structures to structure of arrays. So if I go back, when you do array of structures to structure of arrays, you can see that I modify this structure and then create arrays instead of having that structure. But what about if I don't want to create a new memory? Uh, so it's not that it can happen always, but there are cases where you have an array or you have a array of structures and you can just modify the fields within that or kind of do a permutation such that your memory accesses become much better behaved so that you have less cache misses, you have less TLB misses, you, you go less to memory, so improving your throughput and your memory bandwidth and all those requirements. So this is a particular case out of a particular benchmark called LBM. Uh, if you have looked into both Spec CPU 2006 and Spec CPU 2017, LBM is one of the one of pretty well-known benchmarks, which kind of uh, is a representative of uh, you know various kinds of HPC applications we have, which are kind of stencil computations. So stencil computations are very heavy on the memory. So uh, your your uh, you know scores and other stuff don't improve well because it's like kind of sitting and trying to do memory stuff. So if you look at on the left hand side, what, what it tries to do is, if you are accessing certain fields or certain data in, in separate iterations which are separated, like for example, in iteration zero, you are, you, you are trying to do field one, two, three, and all that, and they are actually separated in memory. So what will happen is you access field zero and then you go all the way up field one, all the way up field two, and you'll have a lot of cache misses and a lot of TLB misses. So instead of that, you kind of morph it. You don't change anything, you morph your indexing function. So you can see below, AI becomes AI percentage M into N plus I by M. It's a kind of simplistic, you can have any morphing function there, okay? So what happens is you don't add any memory to it. Your indexing now becomes morphed such that your accesses become adjacent to each other. And that adjacent axis is actually uh, result in much better cache behavior, much better prefetching, much better TLB uh, behavior. And, and that's a kind of real life example. You, if you look at LBM and if you, you, you take uh, array remapping, it does improve uh, performance quite a bit. So these are like vectorization and then data layout. These are next on loop optimizations, which are scalar in nature. The first one is loop versioning LICM. This is one of the first uh, slightly non-trivial optimization that we upstreamed into uh, LLVM, which is available today. So if you look at normal LICM, uh, if you have aliasing, uh, you are not able to do uh, you know, LICM. So um, taking cue from what we do in uh, vector loop vectorization, that you do memory bounds check and figure out, OK, should I vectorize or should I go to scalar code? Okay. So you have the original loop, and so you introduce, when you, when you see aliases, which you cannot resolve uh, using your normal aliasing techniques uh, at, at, at compile time, uh, you create two versions of the code with memory bounds check, uh, one with the alias and one without the alias. And the loop uh, without the alias obviously can now have LICM uh, working for it, while the one which has alias doesn't have a LICM. So uh, this has been upstreamed already, and there are some restrictions to it, you know, as usual in, in, uh, in loop vectorization also, that if, if your number of memory bounds check is too many and so on and so forth, you probably cannot still do that, because it may kind of you know, um, hurt your performance rather than improve it. Uh, partial loop on switch, this is Something we presented at Euro LLVM last year, one of my colleagues presented Euro LLVM last year. Uh, so you may not be able to see all the code here, but the interesting part is if you look at the original loop at the left, uh, this a condition test like if x is actually not an invariant because x actually is modified in, in the else part of it. But the nice thing is if it ever enters the if x path, it will never enter the else path ever because X is not modified. So if you make that observation, you see this kind of a path on switching. So you have to understand the path 
And then if it goes to that path, you do on switching only on those path. So if it ever goes to the else path, you can never do on switching. So what you do is if you can analyze this kind of code, you can then put the if condition outside and then just do the if part of the code as, of, as the for loop and the else part remains as the original uh, loop. So uh, this once again has uh, uh, some implications in some of the benchmarks and applications that I have worked in. Uh, when you presented last year, I think there were some comments saying that this may be very similar to uh, index set splitting, uh, but frankly, we really didn't go back and really don't, didn't do any work on that. But you know, there may be some versions or flavors of uh, index set splitting uh, in this particular piece of work. Uh, other loop optimizations, um, induction variable life, uh, lifetime splitting, what we saw with LLVM is in deep loops, um, we really needed to split the lifetimes, otherwise there was a lot of spilling happening lower down in the pipe. And uh, also the LSR, which is the loop strain reduction, was currently uh, restricted only to the innermost nested loop. So we did some fixes to make sure that uh, LSR works at the outer levels also. There was some concern that there'll be some blow up in you know, compile time and other, other issues, but uh, our experience was uh, we didn't see uh, many of those uh, problems. Uh, scalar optimization, so like quite a few scalar optimization we did, but I'll just touch upon a few. Uh, we actually uh, did something specifically for C++ uh, called dynamic cast optimization. So what we did in this is, is a pretty simple idea that if you have your class hierarchy graph, so once again under FLTO, uh, you see your entire class hierarchy, and then uh, there are dynamic cast tests being done on the leaf classes, right? Then you really don't need to uh, do a dynamic cast. You can just replace it by a type ID check. Uh, so if you go and look into the dynamic cast code, and that is there in your library, uh, you know, it, it, it does a bunch of stuff, and you'll have a lot of uh, overheads of doing that dynamic cast check for each and every of these classes. But then that's what is required, right? Otherwise you'll not get the right result. But for leaf classes, actually it's not required. So for leaf classes, you can remove those dynamic cast checks and remove it with just a simple type ID check. And uh, we saw several C++ benchmarks improve, not by a huge amount, but reasonable performance improvement by doing this. Uh, recursion inlining, this is one of the uh, things which I put a few months back. Uh, so we, are, we have uh, included the case where we can do inlining of recursive functions to a certain level. So this is kind of heuristic driven and sometimes driven just by uh, a user defined maybe a, a bound value that uh, we, we, we can you know, work up to. So it will generate function clones and then generate inlines for those function clones uh, up to that uh, depth. So that's more or less uh, some of the major high level or the optimization, the opt that uh, we have done in, in the past, roughly in a period of about two years or, or so. And then on the LLC optimizations, as you may know, um, as I said earlier, we are focused on Zen. Zen is x86, uh, very, very similar to any other x86, but there are differences. So if you know, uh, compared to Skylake, uh, Zen doesn't have uh, AVX512. So really we are still at 256-bit um, AVX, but natively it's still 128 double popped. So there are some, some, some differences also, uh, some of the, uh, uh, you know, ISO that we have, the latencies and other stuff vary from what we have on the Intel side of things. So there are, uh, you know, uh, code that we cannot, I mean, AMD cannot generate for its Zen, which Intel can generate for its Skylake or, or other machines, mainly because uh, we, we will have, let's say, one of our instructions is microcoded, while Intel's is not. So we have to be careful what we are generating there. So in the LLC optimization space, um, we now support a flag. Uh, if you have used AOCC or if you have looked at AOCC, um, we support a flag called 
a march equal to zenver1. This is kind of follow up to our older flags like bdver1, btver1, if you're familiar with older uh, AMD processors like bulldozer and stuff like that. So, so for that, first of all, we built a scheduler model. I'll just have a slide on that later. Uh, in addition, and we made some changes, though it's kind of opt and LLC related, we made some changes to the TTI costing because uh, we need to take care of uh, some of these instructions cost and things like some of the vector instructions which you need to avoid generating. Um, so in the LLC space, these are some of those things that we did. Uh, one of them is promote, promotion of constants to uh, registers. I think in last year's URLVM, there was some talk from ARM around something similar. So if you have a constant um, which is being used again and again in some of your instructions, for example, in let's say an add instruction, we can replace it by a move and then the add from the registers, mainly because in Zen, uh, it has a shorter instruction encoding. And as a result of that, the front end of the Zen pipe will be you know, uh, moving uh, quicker because of the shorter in instruction encoding. Now, this cannot be for each and every instruction because then you are adding one extra instruction for every um, you know, constant that is being accessed. So the, the overall algorithm is look at the constants that's getting used and see if there are certain constants which are used quite a bit. I mean, quite a bit is under quotes based on some heuristic. And then we can replace that instruction, put it in a register up there uh, at, a, at a suitable place, uh, at a basic block which dominates all the other basic blocks where we can now use those, uh, use that particular register. Uh, redundant load store and move elimination. So this is something we uh, noticed uh, about a year or so back that uh, even after all the optimization and other passes, we see quite a bit of load stores and moves sitting in LLVM just before code gen, which looks to be, have no business of sitting there, basically they are all useless. So mainly you are loading from the same place, storing to the same place. Maybe it's, it's a result of, uh, based on some of the engineers who looked at it, looked like a result of some of the phi elimination that we are doing. So we really don't know uh, from all the phases which are coming, but at this point we have a phase very late in the pipe to go through all these load stores, redundant load stores, and just remove them. Um, branch fusion, as you may know, uh, you know for, for uh, CPUs like Zen, uh, if you have the compare and the, and the test instruction, um, you know, uh, immediately preceding the branch, then we can actually fuse them, okay? So because this, these are all micro-coded, so in the, in the micro-op, uh, fuser, this, they all get fused. Now, this was already there, I think it was already getting fused, but there are cases, once again, as part of the optimization that instructions are getting pushed in between uh, this compare and branch, which is not allowing us to fuse them. Now, it's not really that, you know, they are dependent or anything like that, you can just take that out and fuse them together. So you have to do some one second analysis and look at them and stuff like that. Uh, register pressure or LICM, so this is, though you know it's LICM, we do it pretty low down in the pipe because we need to know that uh, if you are in a very deep loop and you are doing LICM, uh, then moving it very high up may actually cause a lot of register pressure. So this is only under Zen Ver1 because, uh, because we know that these are the number of instructions, uh, sorry, registers that we have and things like that. So the Zen Ver1 scheduler, uh, there's nothing specific here except the fact that uh, we kind of upstreamed it, uh, you know, some time back. Uh, it has uh, all the Zen ISAs that are supported along with uh, their models in terms of how they're working in the pipes, what are the latencies, what's the throughput, and things like that. Uh, there are several microcoded instructions. At this time, for all our microcoded instructions, we have put a very high value such that you know, uh, we do not generate code for them, first of all, basically in the sense that try to avoid them. Secondly, when you are scheduling them, make sure that, you know, you push as many stuff as you can because of such high, uh, you know, costs of this microcode instruction. But, you know, though we have put 100 as a latency, is not necessarily always 100. There's actually quite a bit of difference between many of the microcode instructions. So, uh, Zenver 2, 
which will be our next generation Zen. Uh, we are working in-house for that, so it should come up sometime uh, later. So now uh, on to the results. So you know this was, as I said, kind of two two and a half years effort. And then uh, what did we achieve out of it? Our main focus is at the launch of Epic to have good results for uh, Spec 2017. But unfortunately, Spec 2017 was not launched. It got delayed, and finally, it got launched only later. And then this is what it looks like now. This chart may look a bit busy, but this is spec CPU 2017 rate integer, which means that it's kind of a throughput uh, 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 scores. So here it compares Epic 7601, which is uh, currently AMD's top end 2P server line. So this has 64 uh, cores running 128 threads. And uh, compared with Xeon Platinum 8180, which is once again Intel's now two, top 2P um, SKU, which has 58 threads, uh, 58 cores running 112 threads. Now Intel runs a slightly higher clock, uh, roughly uh, I think around 3 to 3.8, while we are a slightly lower clock, about 2.3 to about 3.2. So, uh, so that's that's the kind of a drill down. They have a slightly higher L2 and L3. We are slightly lower, but you get it. So, so what what are the scores that you have here? So this uses Epic 7601 from Supermicro using AOCC 1.0. AOCC 1.0 was released last May and is synced with, at that point it was synced with LLVM 4, uh, which had got released a few months back. So that, that was the result at that time using AOCC 1.0 compared with Xeon 8180 on an ASUS with ICC's latest compiler, which was released last year on August, ICC 18. And if you look at the scores, I'll just look at this and then may go back. If you look at the scores here, which is the spec 2017 rate, base and peak, AOCC using EPIC is just about 7% behind Intel. Now, if you see, and if you just take a normal uh, clang today from the top of trunk or GCC, it will easily be 15, 20% or higher behind. So, you know, we did quite a, quite a lot uh, of optimizations and did get quite a bit of benefit uh, by, by putting it there. And you see that for some of the benchmarks, actually it beats Intel uh, right now. Uh, for example, in MCF, where the data layout optimizations play a very crucial role, you see a very uh, good numbers for something like DPS Jeng and uh, cases like uh, in Omnit, where some of the C++ optimizations uh, come into play. So this is for, um, you can see the scores on the spec website, and this is for uh, FP, for the floating point ones. And if you look at the score here, actually uh, AOCC with EPIC beats Skylake today with ICC. And for today's uh, all 2P results, uh, this is actually a, a spec record score today. So using, you know, we can say that using almost a uh, top of the line open source compiler with some optimizations added, you know, have managed to beat uh, ICC, uh, ICC top compiler by about two, three percent at this point of time. So that is for the spec. If you want to see some uh, comparisons of AOCC versus uh, latest GCC 7 uh, and versus Clang uh, version 5 and uh, 6, you can go to a, uh, the Foronix web page as late as uh, Jan 2018, and you can see uh, you know, some of the comparisons that's, that's happening there. So AOCC resources, uh, if you want to download and have a go at it, you know, we, we are synced with uh, LLVM trunk on almost a daily basis, except for some bugs. We have released AOCC 1.1 of, uh, back in December, and we are on the cusp of releasing 1.2 uh, aligned with LLVM 6.0. And that will also have an experimental flang. It not only works with the Dragon Egg, but it'll also have an experimental flang which you can try for your Fortran uh, code. Uh, in conclusion, you know, uh, for the last two and a half, three years, we have demonstrated a very powerful optimizing compiler built on top of the latest LLVM. We introduced many optimizations in Opton LLCC uh, some of them already upstream, some of them part of discussion. We definitely want to uh, upstream more aggressively, obviously. 
but there are concerns, suggestions, whatever. And once again, a very, very big thank you to the entire community, you know, to make this possible. And the list of acknowledgements part of my team and some other teams uh, working out of mainly uh, AMD Bangalore, uh, you know, working on the compilers, profilers, libraries, and stuff like that. So with that, uh, I conclude my talk. Time for questions. Okay, we have about five minutes for questions here. Thanks, Imian. I think it is very good news for LLVM. Uh, I had a question on the SLP vectorizer uh, data layout where you mentioned uh, the order of, uh, I think it was slide 13, where the ordering was not correct. I was wondering whether it's a task for scheduling. I mean, by reordering the instructions, would you be able to get the data in the right order? Ah, that's a good question. So you were saying that instead of, okay. So uh, uh, you know, as you say, there's SLP goes you know, bottom up in the basic block order. So if you reorder instructions, maybe it will, yes. Yes, sure. Uh, when did you uh, when you measure the performance against the uh, Intel compiler? What library did you use to compare? You mean uh, which? The, yeah, you what, mean math library or uh, math library, C uh, library, everything? So we we this these numbers are on the spec. So we did not measure anything for Intel. Uh, so the thing is. No, I, I mean the, for the uh, AMD platform. Uh, oh, for AMD platform. platform. Yeah. So AMD platforms, if you, okay, for these numbers, for AMD platforms, we use the AMD Mathlib, uh, which is uh, our math library. In addition, uh, for the first time, we used uh, the J malloc library, uh, which is for, you know, better memory, uh, you know, usage. Uh, so these are two main libraries that we use, J malloc and the AMD Mathlib. AMD Libem, yeah. Do we have any more questions? All right, well, that concludes this session. Let's give our speaker another, uh, another thank you. Thank you, Matthew.